Today, I want to talk on the topic, God friended me. We look at a few people and say, God friended me. You may be seated. My, one of my favorite sitcoms um, that there is one surviving member left. <laughs> one surviving member left. The song says, thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a power. Da, 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 and if you threw, y'all know it, and invited everyone, you would the biggest gift from me to you. And the heart attached would say, Thank you for being a friend. Then it goes. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Good job, choir. So I know that that aged because a lot of the millennials and Generation Z and X was like, I don't even know that. I have no idea what they're talking about. There is a sitcom out now called God Friended Me that's um, by a guy named Miles uh, who's on it, but it's a very good show. Um, but I'm not talking about that. I'm just using it as a line. But most of us who do have Facebook are acquainted with getting friend requests. And often when you get friend requests, Jay Sean, your haircut looks good, come on. Often when you get friend requests, um, we do something, and I hope all of y'all have done this, I've done it. Sometimes you look at your friend requests and you see how many mutual friends do we have. Especially if you look at the picture and you don't recognize them, and they say something to you like, we went to school together, you be like, oh. Life has changed you. <laughs> I, um, I'm not currently using my personal Facebook account anymore, and I do want to let y'all know that I have been saying that, uh, because people are saying, you unfriended me. It's not personal. I just wanted to move from a personal friend page to a more public uh, page, only because as the church continues to grow, it's hard to manage all that different type of stuff when people are sending you inboxes about praying for the dog who just can't seem to eat the dog food and stuff like that. So I want to move to a more public page so uh, people can't do all that type of stuff. So pray for Aunt Gilda May and all that type of stuff. So anyway, so, um, but when I did, when I was using my personal Facebook page, I would many times. What was hard is that my wife would say to me, I would say happy birthday to people every single day, and my wife would say, you don't even know those people. <laughs> she said, those are my friends that became your friends because they knew I was married to you. And I don't even know who these people are, but however. Um, but in friend requests, we would often, we had an option to accept them or decline them. Uh, based on mutual friendship or based on us trying to be friends with somebody that we knew. And when it comes to our relationship with God, many of you think that God is deciding daily if he wants to friend you or decline you. So you think that God looks to see if your mutual friendships are holiness, righteousness, love, kindness, church, pastor, all these type of things. But if your, friend, your mutual friend list says, I'm still a work in progress, I still am not together, I still ain't got myself together, you think that God did not, will not accept you because you're not there yet. But I want to talk to you today for the next few minutes that regardless of where you are, God made a decision to friend you regardless of where you are. Look at someone and say, God friended me. According to your message notes, when we look at this particular um, this scripture, he says, first of all, he says, this is my commandment that, man, man, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the first thing. We just can't mail it a series of perfect love, that you love one another as I have loved you. Make sure that you have agape love for other people because you cannot love people from yourself. It's not possible. You have to allow the God character to get inside of you so that you'll learn how to love people. Have you ever been in a situation where people ask you, how do you get along? with them and you can't explain it other than it's just God 
some family members that really get on everybody else's nerves, but you send to, you, you okay with them, and it's a God type of love. Verse 13 says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friend. So what he was saying is, the greatest type of love is a self, uh, it's a, it's a unselfish type of love that you're willing to go out of the way to help somebody. That's what he's saying. Greater love is this. So verse 14, I'm going through this. Verse 14 says, he said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. He's talking about if you're in a relationship with me, don't keep ignoring what I'm saying to you. Don't keep ignoring the things that I'm telling you. Verse 15 says, no longer do I call you servants, for servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. I want to talk for the first few, thank you, for the first few things on your message notes. The first, everyone have message notes. I hope you do. I, I hope everybody got them. Thank you. If you don't have them, please raise your hand. They'll make sure you got it. Thank you so much. So the first thing on your message notes, when it says, I want to talk to you about the characteristics, one, or the burden of a slave. The burden of a slave. First, a slave is unaware. He says, I don't call you slaves. He said, because if you are a slave, you would be unaware. Unaware means you are bound by rules and you are bound by orders. All you do is follow instructions, but you don't know why. You're unaware. And there's a lot of us who have been raised under that type of leadership, and when I say leadership, I'm talking about home leadership, family leadership, parent leadership, whatever, where they say, just do as I say because I tell you to. You're unaware why, but they just tell you, just do it. And a lot of us in this, in this generation, Miles was one of the first that I recognized that when he was growing up, they don't always do just as you say. The next question they ask is why? And that is a learning curve for a lot of us in church today because a lot of us used to do things just because they told us to do it. Now we're in the generation of saying, why? You tell me to wear a suit, why? You tell me I've got to do this, why? And they say, because that's the, that's the thing. And then we, we don't want to back it up by scripture. We just say, well, that's what we've always done. Well, if that's what you've always done, how is that working for you? So if you're a slave, you are unaware. The next thing about being a slave is you are undervalued. He said, I don't undervalue you. And that's what a lot of us feel. And I don't know who this is really opening the eyes to, but a lot of us have really been in the type of church where we felt undervalued. We felt like no matter what we did, we were never good enough. And we never could arise. Can anybody attest to that? To say, I, I've, I always felt guilty. I always felt like nothing was right. You always felt like you always had to do something more. God says, I'm not treating you like that. I don't undervalue. Undervalue means a slave was subservient to the teacher. Means that whatever the teacher told them, they just had to do. They just did it just because the teacher told them. But they didn't know the plans. They didn't know the order. They didn't know anything. So they were just, they felt, well, whatever master tells us to do is what we're going to do. And that's what a lot of us have felt like. I don't know what God has planned for me. I'll just wait to see what he's going to say. Well, he says, I don't treat you as slave, but you are a friend. Here are some benefits of a friend. A benefit of a friend, first is you have unrestrained fellowship. Those of you who have good friends... You don't ever have to define why y'all hang out. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to have an order. You don't have to have an agenda. Y'all just love being around each other. When you have a good friend, you just laugh for nothing. Everything's funny. And, nothing, and you can't even remember why you're really laughing. Have you ever been around somebody that you just start laughing and then y'all get through laughing? You'll be like, now what were we laughing about? Unrestrained fellowship. And some of y'all really don't realize that God laughs more than you do. God is the author of comedy. <clears throat> Way before the kings of comedy, he was up in heaven laughing like they, they crack me up doing that stuff, thinking that it's going to work. It ain't. <laughs> <laughs> he loves to laugh. And a lot of us came out of churches and, and, and religious structures where it was always tight. Yes. Ain't nobody laughing nothing. And if you did, they'd be like, shh. God's trying to tell you. So, you know, it was just, <laughs> but benefits of a friend is you have unrestrained fellowship and the next thing is you have unbridled conversation what that means is God's not holding anything back from you you know how you have a friend who you just talk about everything with some of y'all who were dating in your early years before it got stale or whatever you would just sit on the phone and <sighs> Uh, 
you awake? Yeah. What you doing? Nothing. You sleep? No. <laughs> Unbridled conversation. When is the last time you got lost in your conversation with God? We just be like, hey. He'd be like, hey. <laughs> what you doing? Thinking about you. I mean, ha when's the last time you just had unbridled conversation with God? And that's what he, he's saying. That's how I treat you. I won't hold things from you. I hope this is helping somebody. I'm trying to make this very practical. He says, uh, and so in that scripture, he says, I never, I don't call you servants. I call you friends for everything I've heard from my father, I tell you. So I'm saying this to you before we move forward. If you need to hear something from God, ask him. He won't hold anything from you when you're his friend. How many of y'all got stingy friends? <laughs> they ain't your friend. My wife tells me all the time, I'm working on it. She said, you share everything with me but your food. I'm working on it. But I am. Trying to be more friendly in these last and evil days. But what I'm saying is, when it comes to food, I'll be like, <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> why you ordered what you ordered, but you still want some of mine. If you wanted what I got, you could have ordered it. I just, I'm confessing, I need help, Desmond. I really do need help. Somebody lay hands on me and say, come out of him. Come out right now. It's a spirit of stinginess. I'm working on it. Kenneth, you working on it too? I know. We all. Can a brother say, yeah. It's just all of us. <laughs> Maybe it's a man thing. I don't know. I got five on it. I don't know. <laughs> Unbridled conversation. <laughs> all right. C.S. Lewis says this. I got to go on unless y'all laugh too long. C.S. Lewis says, but one of the worst results of being a slave and being forced to do things is that when there is no one to force you anymore, you find you have almost lost the power of forcing yourself. Some of y'all came out of extreme rule-based religion that forced you to do everything. Now you are in a liberated situation and because no one is forcing you, you don't have the ability to do it anymore. You know, those of us who came out of extreme holiness, five o'clock in the morning prayer. We had a shut-in, five o'clock to six o'clock, five o'clock to six, five, you know, we had a shut-in on Friday till Saturday. Those of you who are millennials, Generation Z, y'all don't know nothing about it, don't even worry about it. And I don't know why you brought a pillow to a shut-in. Because you don't go to sleep and shut-in. Shut-in means the door is closed and you seek the Lord all day and all night. If by reason you happen to find a good pew to hide on, you went to a pew and hid, and then you woke up and be like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, that's what we did. <laughs> but now, now that you're not forced and you no longer feel guilty, now we push snooze on our prayer. Because no one is checking to see if you do it. That was the first issue I had to overcome as being a pastor because the churches that a lot of us came out of, we were a part of the tattletale ministry. where we used to lurk on other people's pages, lurk other people's lives, and then we would send a picture to the pastor and say, they shouldn't be leading worship tomorrow. They were at the club Saturday night. I thought you should know. Well, I decided that I didn't want to be in people's lives. I mean, I do, but I mean, I didn't want to be lurking in the sense of, I don't need to see what you do. My job is to preach the word, to teach the word, and if they receive the word, God will change them. 
not by rules. Can I get an amen in that? You know, God will change us. And to me, I feel that's more liberating because God is not just sitting around saying, you missed it, you didn't do it right. But I am saying, let me remind you what God says about you. Let me remind you of who you can become. And if I keep saying that long enough, eventually someone say, you know what? I don't even want to do what I used to do anymore. Not because you made me, but because I found out there's better than what I was doing. Anybody can testify to that. So as we move on, the question is, well then, if he made me his friend, why does he know all I am? Uh, does he know all I do, all that I'm still struggling with, and why would he want to be my friend? Have you ever asked that question? I have. God, why do you want to use me? Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was in Kentucky State University, I was in Gospel Ensemble, and uh, at that year, Guillaume, everybody was announcing their call to preach. It was like the thing to do. <laughs> It was just like, I don't know what it was. It was just like a trend. Everybody, we, we would get from rehearsal, I want to announce my call, whatever. So when I, <laughs> when I finally stopped running and accepted that this is what God wanted me to do, there was this guy who knew how unrestrained I was at college. And when I did say I was called, he said, Lord, God is just calling anybody these days. <laughs> Have you ever just looked at your life and said, God, I don't know why you want me? Yeah. That's what I'm saying, yeah. to say that, to be able to look at yourself, because you, nobody knows you like you do. Yeah. <laughs> you know yourself. We see you for a few hours on Sunday, but you know you. And for God to keep waking you up every day, you're like, Lord, you woke me up again? Why? I made a mess of it yesterday. And he's like, because I want to give you another chance. So the question is, why have he, why are we his friends? First thing is, in your notes it says, he chose me before I chose him. I'll tell you, that makes me want to go to Starbucks. He chose me <laughs> before I chose him. What that means is, for everybody who keeps saying these songs, we sing these songs, Angie, we sing the songs that say, I'm so glad I found the Lord in time. I didn't find him. He found me. God wasn't playing peekaboo with me. Hide and go seek, like, can you find me? <laughs> you know where I am? He wouldn't know. God was open. I was lost. I was playing hide and go seek with him. I was like, I ain't ready yet. <laughs> Doing everything I can. Have you ever gone so, have you ever tried to be so wrong that you thought that you would be so wrong that God would forget that he called you? Somebody tell the truth. Well, you said, I'm just going to smoke it out. Eventually, I'll get so buzzed that he'll forget. In the midst of your, uh, midst of your circle coming out of your mouth, he'll be like, I still want you. <laughs> You'll be like, God, is that you? He'll be like, keep on, but I'm on the other side. <laughs> you can't smoke a call away. You can't sex it out. I'm trying to tell y'all, and I, I got a mixed company, so I can't say what I want to say, but I remember times in college where I was doing things I know I wasn't supposed to do and in rooms I wasn't supposed to be in, and in the midst of it, a strong sense of, I need to say, Lord, I'm sorry, came upon me. I remember one particular time I was in a place I wasn't supposed to be in, a person I wasn't supposed to be in, and in the midst of it, I just started speaking in tongues, and I was like, hey, da, 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 da. I mean, I just went, I'm serious, I'm not making this up. I went straight in. <laughs> Because conviction fell on me. I was like, whatever. When I came to myself, they were gone. I, I was so embarrassed. I was like, Lord, help me to get it together. Because you can't escape from what he's called you to do. You can't. He'll give you time, but you can't escape it. All right, move on. Ephesians, the first chapter, 3 through 6 says this. Ephesians, I got word for it. I want to tell you all my stories. Y'all can't handle it. Ephesians, first chapter. Three says, this is all before mail, so don't even start. Blessed, verse three says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord. Because I'm telling you all these things because, you know, people take stuff and run with it. They be like, you know, the pastor. And then they go to mail and be like, you know, I saw, I ain't dumb. I know how y'all work. Anyhow, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. If you're wondering why you might not have sustained blessing, it might be because you're not in Christ. 
Because if you're in Christ, there's blessings in Christ. He's blessed me with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That means that before he created light and day, he had already chosen me. Before he said the water, you can only go this far, he already said, I have people that I have chosen. That we should become holy and blameless before him. This says, in love he predestined. The word means he already chose me in love. He didn't choose me. Um, you know how sometimes people tell you, get around people who celebrate you, not just people who tolerate you. Sometimes we choose people because we tolerate them. He said, no, I predestined you in love. It wasn't, I didn't tolerate you, I loved you. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. It was his will to adopt me to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this real quick. I text my sister this morning because I wanted to understand more about adoption. My sister just recently adopted a child. Her name is Brooklyn, um, and she's, uh, she's um, um, a, a white uh, child that she adopted. And um, I say that for a reason, but she adopted her, so notice, noticeably, when you see them, you know that they don't look alike, obviously. But she adopted her, her both of her, children, her parents had passed away, um, and it was a very unfortunate situation. But I asked, my, when I looked at that, he predestined us for adoption. A lot of times, when you think of the word adoption, we think that that's beneath Beneath somebody who's biological. We're like, oh, you just adopted. You know, sorry. Like, it's a bad story. Well, I asked her, what exactly did you have to go through to be adopted, to adopt Brooklyn? And she said, I had to take trainings. I had to get certified. I had to go through termination of birth parents. I had to hire lawyers. I had to sign, hear this part here, this shout at me. She said, I had to sign a covenant that once she's adopted, she's mine, and it can't be reversed. I had to sign a covenant that no matter what they say, it can't be reversed. I'm saying to you, there is nothing you can do that can reverse what God says about you. He signed a covenant. It said, and then she said, I had to explain to her that she's mine, and I had to reassure her. Ooh, geez, ooh. She said, I had to reassure her over and over that I'm not going to abandon her. Yeah. I'm trying to tell you what God feels about you. When you see that word adoption, he had to go through a lot of different things to make sure that the covenant could not be erased. The last thing it says, she said, once she got my last name, she was so excited all day and called me mom. This is what she said. She said, she said, I'm famous. I'm Miles Radford's cousin. <laughs> I didn't know Miles was famous, but that's what she said. <laughs> and I'm saying this to you, uh, Mel, we didn't know, so we don't want her to be great. <laughs> but I'm saying that to you, God went through a ceremony. My sister took pictures of a ceremony showing everybody who had been a part of the process to be able to be a part of this process of being adopted. It was a big ceremony. Y'all missed the ceremony that Jesus did for you. It was on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. It was the emblem of suffering and shame. That cross was the ceremony that all of hell was looking, saying, you want them? He said, I'm going to do a ceremony, a covenant that's going to be signed in blood, that no matter what they do, over 2,000 years later, it will never never be reversed. Look at someone say, it can't be reversed. It can't be reversed. All right. Did that bless you? I just want you to know that. Stop looking at yourself as like, you know, he just accepted me. No, he went through something to make sure that you knew that nothing, and, and what happens is, Domine, we have to constantly hear him reassure us that he loves us. 
because a lot of us feel like he's going to abandon us like your daddy did. You feel like he's going to abandon you like your mama did or like somebody else did because every time you did something wrong, they left. So every time something interrupts your life, you're like, oh, so you leaving? So every time God, you do something wrong and something bad happens, you say, God's just punishing me. No, it doesn't work like that. God is not waiting to punish you. I wish I had more voice than I got right now. But God is not waiting. Him and the devil, he's not sitting there saying, do it. Give them cancer. Make sure they're pregnant. They shouldn't have been. He's not doing that. The Bible says, it's not my scripture. The Bible says, where sin was, so was grace. You're waiting on God to out you, and he's not going to. I want this to sink in your life. He is not going to leave you. He is not going to abandon you. Abandon you. If anybody leaves, it'll be you. Jason, the times that I felt far away from God was not because he changed his position. I changed my position. I left. I did my own thing. But when I came back, he was like the father of the prodigal child saying, I knew you was going to come back home. That's why the Bible says for every parent, I want to encourage you. If you raise your child up in the way that they should go, no matter what they do, when they come to themselves, they will come back to this place that you taught them. They're going to come back. I can't tell you how many times I came back. It wasn't just one time. I came back a few times. Anybody else came back a few times? Well, you kept leaving. You kept come, well, leaving home. I got to get out of here because you get mad at your parents sometimes. Tell the truth. We get mad at God sometimes. You ain't give me the job I want. I'm leaving. We do that. But God, every time we do it and we have our tantrum, God says, I was waiting for you to get through. Is, that, is it out of your system now? I still love you. Someone say, he still loves me. Lord Jesus, Psalms 8, Lord, I love the word. That's why it's hard for me to get through it. Psalms 8 says, O Lord, O our Lord, how excellent or how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes. Don't you dare overlook your child. Don't overlook your child. Don't overlook your cousin. Don't overlook your nephew. Like, it's something different about them. Whatever that different is, develop it. Yes. Yes. Develop it. And if you can't develop it, give it to somebody who can. Right. Put them around greatness. Let's stop waiting on people. When they get 18, they're going to be something. They can be something at 10. Right. They can be something at 8. Right. You be like, they got a mouth on them. Make them a lawyer. They always want to dress up. Get them around a fashion designer. I'm saying, let's stop looking over people and saying they get on my nerves. There's something about them that needs to be developed. And if you're not the one that can develop them, don't mess the child up by keeping them stagnant because you don't know what to do with them. All right. Verse 3 says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? That's the question. What is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you came for him? For you made him a little lower than heavenly beings. One version says you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory. Well, that means stop looking at yourself lower than the angels. I mean, you, you put yourself down here. He said, no, I just made you just a little bit lower than the angels. You're not lower than the people who are trying to mess you up. Stop putting yourself beneath people and put yourself beneath angels. <laughs> you put yourself, my, my supervisor gets on my nerves. Well, get over it. Put them under you. Because you are under angels. Look at someone say, I'm under angels. I'm, I'm under angels. Say it again. I'm under angels. We used to sing the song all night, all day. Angels are watching over me. All right, go on. Verse 6 says, you have given him dominion. I'm trying to teach y'all. He's giving you dominion over the works of your hands. Stop walking around saying, I can't get a job. 
He has given you dominion over the works of your hand. What that means is he will not give you weak hands. Maybe the job you're looking for is beneath you. Maybe he wants to develop an entrepreneur in you. Because we keep training our children to go find a job. And we don't train them how to develop a skill set or train them how to dream or train them how to get out the box. And the reason we don't train them how to get out the box is because we never got out the box. So because I've never done it, I tell you, you can't do it. This is not supposed to be a parenting message, but this is what we do. We put caps on our people. We put caps on people who are around because we never thought we could be it. But you need to learn how to look at people and say, I never thought I could, but I believe you can. Because he's given us dominion. Someone say dominion. The word dominion means power. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is our land. All right, good, good. So the next thing on your notes is this. Now I'm going to be through. Our purpose produces our promise. All right? That's went over your head, and it's okay. I'm going to teach it. I'm going to be through. Drop the mic and go on. Our purpose produces our promise. Some of y'all are waiting on a promise, but you hadn't done nothing. Y'all be like, I'm just waiting on God. Just sitting here wondering what he's going to do and when he's going to come through. Have you, have you done anything? No, I'm just waiting on him. He's gonna come. He may not come when I want him, but he's going to come on time. And y'all sitting here, and you haven't done anything. You haven't even put in an application. Waiting on a job that you haven't applied for. Some of y'all say, I want to be in a relationship, but you won't date. In all transparency, I'm just saying what is going on with y'all is you have to be able to learn how to try something, get out there, have enough discernment to know when the dinner needs to end. And nothing wrong with going out. Just go out and be like, you know what? I have discerned that you are wasting my time. And go on. Our purpose, sorry, don't y'all say that. Like my pastor tells me to say, don't y'all do it. Our purpose produces our promise. This is what it means. Verse 16 says, of John 15 says this, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he must give you. So what that means is he chose you to do something. He didn't choose you just to sit around and shout and choose you to say, I'm going to church. He said, no, I chose you so that you would bear fruit and that you would do something. What that means is you are a seed in the ground. What seed goes into a ground and never produces anything? If you plant an apple for a seed, an apple tree, whatever, it will grow up. It will produce. So I'm saying if he's produced something in you, why has nothing come out of it yet? You are a seed in the ground. Tell somebody, I'm a seed. I'm a seed. There's something you're supposed to be doing. I don't know what your something is, but you won't find it until you do something. Make a whole lot of mistakes until you learn what you're supposed to do. Some of y'all are too scary. Just scared. We blow on you. Be like, ooh. Just scared. Learn how to try things. Everything I've done in my life, I didn't know if it was going to work. When I started the Bible study, I was scared. When I put out a CD a long time ago, I was scared. There was another one's coming. When I did, I was scared. All these different things have scared me, but I had to learn and say, just try it. Just do something. If it don't work, at least you'll have something to laugh about later. You'll be looking at your grandkids and like, yeah, I, I remember that time I tried. It was a mess, but I tried it. Learn how to try. Someone say, try something. He said, I did not choose you to just sit here. I didn't choose you to just sit around every Sunday and say, I'm receiving a word. Because that's what a lot of us do, is we are res we receive stuff and do nothing with it. The only place that does not do anything is called the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a place that you go into it and nothing comes out of it. Everything is stagnant. But you are supposed to flow. 
There's supposed to be something coming into you and something going out of you. Life is coming into you and life goes out of you. How dare us get encouraged every Sunday and we don't encourage anybody during the week. Whatever goes in you, his spirit goes in you, you've got to give it to somebody else. Someone say, give it to somebody else. All right, let me go on. All right, thank you, Brother Leon. I've been waiting on it for 20 minutes. Thank you. So this is the thing, my last eight minutes. He says, whatever, someone say whatever. Yes. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, some of y'all said, I keep asking God for stuff and he didn't give me anything. I'm going to tell you why. Sometimes wrong motives can block your promise. Yes. <laughs> the mom stood up like, show you right. Sometimes you don't have stuff because your motive's off. You want word for it? I got word for it. James, the fourth chapter, verse one, first, first, uh, it says this. What causes fights, quarrels among you? Is it not this? That your passions are at war within you? I know. It ain't Medea's either. Is it that possibly you got a war going on in you? Is that maybe why you're fighting everybody? Because it's not them, but it's something in you that you hadn't checked? So you like to hate on everybody else? Because it's really something that's going on within you? Is that why we fight each other? Is that why we hate on each other? When people get jobs, I, I, I can't stand actually working around people or being with people who are always saying what somebody else doesn't deserve. Yeah. Yeah. The truth is, I don't deserve what I have. I don't. Not at all. But I thank God that I got it, but it's not because I deserve it. Anybody else can testify about that? I didn't deserve it. Verse 2 says this. You desire and you don't have. So because you don't have it, what do you do? You murder. Samuel said, I ain't convicted, but you should be. We murder with our mouths. We don't have what we need to have. You desire it, but you don't have it. So since you don't have it, you say everybody else don't need it. I know this is hard. I'm learning. You covet and cannot obtain. So you covet, you look at somebody's car, you want it, but you can't afford it, but you want it. So you fight and quarrel. Does this not identify half of the churches and stuff we came out of and the people we're around and the friendships that we have? Most of our conversation revolves around what somebody doesn't need or deserve. You do not have because you do not ask. So, this is a, the power of this scripture. So, y'all sitting around, we are sitting around. Let me take out of y'all because y'all get offended, want to fight me. We sit around and talk about everybody else. We want it, but we don't have it. And, Don Teresa, the reason we don't have it is because you hadn't even asked. Mr. Alisa, do you understand how simple it is? It's not the deep things that we trip over. It's the simple stuff. So, instead of you talking about somebody, why don't you ask how they got it? We don't have because we don't ask. So we quarrel and we fight and we fight with each other instead of just asking. And it says, you ask. Oh, he says, he said one thing, he said you didn't ask. He said, but you do ask. But when you do ask, you don't receive because your motives are wrong. You want something for your passions. You know you don't need ice cream, but you want it. How many of us, we ask God, Lord, if you just give it to me, I promise you I'll be a good steward of it. And you lying. Thank you, Mr. Leon and Mr. They like. That's a whole bunch of us who we ask for things that we don't need it. We don't need, but we want it so we can floss. We want it so we can post it on Instagram. We want it so our friends can think we got what we don't have. He says, so when you do ask, I don't give it to you because you don't even need it. You don't need the cookie. Eat the broccoli. And you say, but I don't like it. But it's what you need. And we get upset 
Because when God, you say, I want a partner, you can't handle it because you ain't got your passions together. But I want it. So then you wind up with somebody that's going to beat you because you wanted passion and set a purpose. If you wait on the Lord, he will strengthen your heart. Somebody say, wait. You ain't got, there's no shortage of men. You don't have to sleep your way up. I only got three more minutes. I'll stop. Y'all can't handle too much more. But I'm saying, you are trying to get there by any means necessary. God said, no, I'm not going to give you stuff because you have a tantrum. Some things you're going to have to go through until you get there. You're going to have to learn how to, you're going to have to learn how to go through for this thing. You might have a few more nights of loneliness. Because maybe who you think you need is not what you need. You need to learn how to love yourself before somebody else loves you. Because if you don't love yourself, can't nobody else love you. If you don't date yourself, can't nobody else date you. If you don't know how to brush your own teeth, ain't nobody going to be around you anyway. Stop letting your passions guide you and let your purpose propel you. Psalms 37 verse 4 says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's how it works. Delight means be happy in the Lord. Meaning, those of you who still have parents that are alive, those of you who still have friends that you're with, you know what they like because you've been around them. I'm saying to you, be around God long enough so you can find out what he likes. So once you find out what he likes, he'll give you what you like. Now let me clean up around that. Because what happens is, you'll start to say, God, I only, come on, sorry. I try to go through, I try to go through a whole message without a movie. But she asked him one time, she said, what type of food do you like? Whatever type of food you like. And that's why I'm saying, don't do it, Jermaine. What I'm saying is, when you have a relationship with God, you'll say, Lord, do you want me to date them? Lord, is that job for me? Lord, do you want me to continue this unforgiveness or do I need to squash it? Whatever pleases you is where I want to be. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you desires. What we say in our message notes is this. Align with God's desire, and his desire will become what you desire. Yeah. Align with God's desire, and his desire will become what you desire. God, what do you want from me? And whatever you want from me is what I want. Karen Clark Sheard said, the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. Some of y'all are in the way of God and not in the will of God. <laughs> the safest place is in his will, not in his way. Because when you're in God's way, he'll bump you over. And I don't want God to bump me over. I want to be in his will. Anybody else want to be in his will? Last thing, Matthew, the sixth chapter. I'm through. Kenan, give me my music. Matthew 6, chapter 33 says, but seek first. Someone say first. The kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. If there's something in your life that you're asking God for, if there's something that you need, go ahead, ask him. But seek him first. Put him at the first. Say, Lord, whatever it is you want, I want you first. Mark Batterson in our 40-day our devotional says, God is great not just because nothing is too big for him. God is also great because nothing is too small. Thank you for watching the message, but I want to make sure that you're connected beyond the message. Visit our website or stay connected to all of our social media sites so that you can find different ways to get plugged in. I would love to meet you on Sundays at 1 p.m. or our first Tuesdays for our Impact Night. Be sure to like and subscribe and even share this channel so that we can continue to reach people. 
If you would like to help us even reach people further, please click the Give Now button when you visit our website. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.